it's not to say that women don't engage in these kind of hard power senses. And so I'd caution about that as well, because I think that sometimes becomes a stereotype that, you know, women should be looking at cultural issues or women should be thinking only about development spaces uh, or only working on the global south. I think women have a voice on and should have a voice on issues across the board uh, where, from kind of, you know, soft power issues to hard power issues to and anything and everything in between. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series presented by Carnegie India, celebrating stirring stories of empowerment, struggle and success from women professionals in different fields across the globe. Stories we hope are bound to inspire young professionals. I'm Ayush Mohan working with the Security Studies Program at Carnegie India. Today, in our latest episode, we are honored to have Dr. Tanvi Madan with us. Tanvi is a senior fellow in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. She's also the host of the Global India podcast. Her work explores India's role in the world and its foreign policy, focusing in particular on India's relations with China and the United States. She's the author of the widely acclaimed book, Fateful Triangle, How China Shaped U.S.-India Relations During the Cold War. She's also a member of the editorial board, of Asia Policy and a contributing editor at War on the Rocks. Tanvi, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thanks, Ayush. It's great to be on the podcast. Okay, so beginning with the first question. You have had a very accomplished and an eventful academic journey. Can you like sort of please make us walk through that journey of yours and maybe a little bit tell us like what were your motivations in the early days as a young student that drove you to pursue this field and make a mark for yourself? So as a historian, one of the things that you're often taught is, you know, you pick up a book and you always go and see the first thing you look at is when was it written? Because origins and context of when uh, those books are written matter. And so I think human beings are a similar way. We are in some ways a product of the context in which we grew up, uh, in which we exist, uh, in our location, etc. And that was true for me as well. I grew up in 1980s uh, Delhi, um, where Delhi was going through, India was going through a lot. But also that 80s, 90s period meant that I saw many transitions globally, whether it was the collapse of the Soviet Union, India's key foreign policy partner, whether that was the um, first Gulf War, uh, which affected India in many ways, including in terms of a, resulting in a balance of payments crisis. Uh, but also a transition with those things contributing to change in India itself, uh, as your view listeners would know, which is, you know, India opening up economically. So I remember the India before it opened up, before, you know, we there was easier access to global TV, to mobile phones, uh, to kind of a very different India where, you know, our, our kind of uh, uh, one TV channel was Doodash. And I say that because uh, it tells you kind of I've seen the transition, but also what how India's dealing with the world changed over this time. So the curiosity in me in the 80s kind of stayed with me forever was which was seeing all these changes in the world. It was almost you didn't even have to read fiction. It was happening in the world. It was happening in India and it was happening in relations, India's relations with the world. Uh, and I was just curious about, you know, why were these things happening? Um, and so part of it was just figuring out these connections. My favorite TV show on that one channel, Durdarshan, was The World This Week, uh, which was showed every Friday evening. And the nerd that I was, that was my favorite TV show. Uh, I used to read the magazines that we did get. Uh, and so, again, this was all about me just wanting to know and the curiosity 
uh, of uh, how global developments were shaping the choices I just personally, forget India uh, as a country, I personally had access to as those uh, developments affected India and India's choices in the world uh, changed. Um, so for me, my interest in international affairs, I think, partly came from the times I lived in, uh, where you did see uh, a lot of developments at home, abroad, in the region taking place. So it is more of a case of a lived experience as to how you saw the world around you and you in part of that world that sort of went on to like shape what you do right now. And Yes, you and I think just a yes, lived experience, but also, you know, um, the influences around you in terms of the books you read, the people uh, you're around. So, uh, you know, dining table conversations, debating things about the world, including India's relationships with what are now key partners, but what were then still very debated issues. Yeah, absolutely. Those things do have a like a sort of a great mark in terms of like how you or like maybe most of us decide to like sort of segue our things into things we do. But you chose international relations as a discipline, which has this sort of like sort of critique also that it's very male centric and the phenomenon of war altogether itself. It's been mostly looked from the perspective, from the lens where it's been dominated by the male centric view. And so, like, in terms of stretching more onto it, like, do you feel that this growing wave of women entering the field of international relations and policy making are bringing a change or maybe reshaping the arena to any degree in your experience? So I think it is true in international relations, and particularly when you look at things like security studies or foreign and security policy, when you looked around, you largely saw and read from or heard from uh, men. Having said that, uh, again, going back to you know you, the kind of origins, I grew up uh, with my first prime minister that I remember was Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And so to me, the idea that women didn't get involved in or couldn't do foreign policy or international affairs or couldn't engage was alien. Um, I, I grew up with a mother who uh, worked, who had been on uh, uh, medical research fellowships abroad. And so the idea that women didn't engage with the world or women didn't work in outside the home, because uh, obviously women's work at home matters too and contributes to the Indian economy in kind of indirect and direct ways as well. But you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't alien to me that women's voices were should be heard and mattered and could matter. And so for me, you know, the idea of seeing, I think it is important to have women's voices in this space, not just to check off a number to say, look, we have one person on a, uh, one woman on a panel. So, you know, we're not going to be criticized uh, for having a manual. It's because women uh, you know, any diversity of views, whether it's women, whether it's kind of people from different kind of economic classes, people of different races or ethnicities, you, as I said, you are a product of your experiences and they bring different experiences to the table looking at similar issues. Uh, and so for me, that uh, importance of diversity and having women uh, writing, speaking on, represented in these discussions of international affairs matters because, again, global developments affect women too. It's not just affecting uh, uh, it affecting men. And so there should be this aspect that women should get to have a say uh, on these issues. Now, one thing I'd caution against, you know, we sometimes think that um, women will have a very different view just because they're women. And, you know, you mentioned war. And I always point out that while we say this is, you know, this is a very male issue, if you go back and think about women, the first kind of women leaders in many countries, uh, they're not exactly the most peace loving uh, people or don't, you know, they, they're not people who hesitate from using force. Now, whether you look at Golda Meir uh, in Israel, uh, who was leader at the time of the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War, uh, or it was Indira Gandhi with the 1971 war, or Maggie Thatcher going, you know, with the war in the Falklands, uh, or over the Falklands. And so, 
it's not to say that women don't engage in these kind of hard power senses. And so I'd caution about that as well, because I think that sometimes becomes a stereotype that, you know, women should be looking at cultural issues or women should be thinking only about development spaces uh, or only working on the global south. I think women have a voice on and should have a voice on issues across the board uh, where, from kind of, you know, soft power issues, jihad power issues, to and anything and everything in between. Yes, and I guess like uh, in the present times, of course, like after going through so many changes and after a lot of assertion, the governments across the globe like sort of are also focusing on this particular aspect. And uh, given your work, which primarily like focuses on the Indian and US foreign policy, so there are forums like US India Alliance for Women's Economic Empowerment for bringing women to the fore in terms of shaping the relations that the two countries have. So if I talk about those institutional mechanisms where there has been sort of a this entire setting has been institutionalized where women centric sort of engagement in terms of following or shaping the relations between the two countries have begun to at least spur out. Do you think there is a need for more sort of these institutional mechanisms between countries, especially for like the countries in the global south and the global north to have these sort of institutional mechanisms where they specifically focus on leveraging the potential of women to deepen those ties between the two countries? Uh, Ayush, it's a good question. I think in some ways this effort has to be both top down in the institutional sense, but also bottom up. Um, so I think it can't just be about institutions because many people will not have access to those institutions. Um, they will uh, include some and exclude others. Um, so I think institutions are important or these kind of initiatives are important in raising the consciousness uh, and the profile, bringing leaders in con the countries to the table, uh, perhaps serving as platforms to uh, mentor uh, uh, places for exchanging, you know, um, for, for the example you gave on the India-US side, you can have discussions about different experiences in different countries, uh, sharing, you know, what has worked and what has not. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you, it also has to involve more than institutions. Uh, it has to involve changes in culture, um, changes in, and kind of everyday changes in how we approach the idea of women in the in the kind of in this space, whether uh, that is on panel discussions, whether that is in a conference room, whether that is even thinking about women's research, and for example, ensuring that we cite women's work more often. Um, so it's kind of these everyday choices and behaviors that also have to change. I think institutions can play a role. Uh, and they are to be encouraged, but I don't think institutions alone can be the answer to ensuring that women's voices uh, have more representation. And I think this is a task that has to be done by women themselves, but also importantly by men in role as mentors, employers, uh, leaders, uh, but also in terms of uh, allies and colleagues uh, and friends as well. So if I like sort of narrow this argument and like maybe focus on spaces and particularly institutions and policy think tanks where with something where you also work. So do you think or what maybe are there like more initiatives of policy like in terms of like that is essential for fostering more inclusive and diverse environment within think tanks and policy institutions as such? So I think I'll say that one of the things, it's a constant work in progress. And I see uh, my own institution, the Brookings Institution, and how it's changed from the first time I was there as a research assistant, assistant between 2003 and 2006 and now. Um, and what you saw is in that earlier period, uh, far fewer women, uh, far fewer younger people in, at the scholars level, uh, far fewer uh, uh, people of color. Uh, in kind of at that scholars level. Uh, and today you see across the board a uh, change in this aspect. And particularly, I, I look at my own for program, my foreign policy program that I am part of. Um, uh, we have a lot more female scholars. We have a lot of and diverse in, in many different dimensions. But we also have 
um, uh, kind of younger folks as well uh, in represented. Um, we used to ask this question when I was a research assistant, how come can you know, 70 to 80 percent of the research assistants um, were women and only 20 to 30, 20 percent, maybe maximum, if not uh, less, were, of the scholars were women? What happened between RA level and scholar level? Um, and today you're seeing a lot more women at that scholar level at Brookings and a lot more, and especially at the, in the Brookings Foreign Policy Program. Uh, and you're seeing kind of uh, the RAs continue uh, to be, I think it's a little bit more balanced even there, but nonetheless uh, have that representation. So one of the things I think about is looking at just that, forget kind of broader policy prescription. I look at, you know, what happened? And it goes back to what I said about there was a top-down effort uh, partly it was made a priority by our leadership at both the institutional level and the programmatic level uh, to think about how do you actually, um, you know, make sure when you're thinking about recruitment and retention, uh, what are the policies you change? Uh, what are the policies that will make this a more inclusive environment. Now, I will add, this has not, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you this is an emphasis on uh, on kind of, uh, d you know, DEI and diversity and inclusion and equity over substance. And that's not the case at all. If anything, on a substantive level, I think this has added uh, a kind of a, a lot more uh, nuance, a lot more uh, diversity, even in terms of uh, views. So I think, you know, having more women also has helped in terms of the role model sense. As you see more women in terms of scholars, you think I can do that too. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, um, we've seen is, so it is it was top down, it was the leadership making it a priority, it was uh, changing policies. And like I said, this is still a work in progress, but made it more conducive uh, for women kind of uh, to, to be part of uh, um, that kind of scholar level. Uh, but it also meant, you know, we've seen even beyond the numbers, I think it also took from uh, the kind of from colleagues having a different view, including male colleagues, to be more encouraging uh, of female uh, voices, um, to make an effort to ensure that we don't do manuals anymore. And believe it or not, this was there was a, a, a around DC. I remember when this, you know, first came up, just like in Delhi, you know, you'd hear the same complaints. Oh, this is kind of forced, etc. Now it's natural. It's uh, you, do, you know, you, you're not seeing these discussions anymore. Um, and I think you saw efforts on the part, for example, of women themselves, including, I would say, for me personally, making sure that you also actually spoke up, uh, that actually participated, actually had uh, those voices made sure uh, that we too were not kind of sitting back and, uh, you know, letting our natural reluctance sometimes or reticence or saying that, you know, other people know better, uh, uh, um, stop us from actually taking advantage. Now, I would say, you know, there's there's a fair bit of privilege involved in the discussion on what we've done uh, at Brookings, and I think we've you know there's always this is a constant effort to ensure how do you uh, you know have both quality and diversity, and I think you know this is something that we'll strive to do. Uh, but I do think there are things, including not just at Brookings. I think I've seen, and by the way, I've seen the situation improve at think tanks. Uh, in in Delhi as well, you see a lot more women in the space, and I think encouraging that, but also ensuring that women have the confidence and finding ways to see it's not, it's not necessarily policies; it's even as I said, behavior. So that there's a culture of actually in saying, um, you know, if there is, for example, I'll just give you a small example, ensuring something like whenever there's an event, we talk a lot about who's on the panel. Uh, but ensuring that, you know, when question and answers come up, that you take questions not just from men putting their hands up, uh, but women as well. Sometimes actually saying, are there any in the women in the room who have a question? So I think there is a change in policies that you can do. And this involves uh, everything from, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a believer necessarily in quotas as such, but I think in terms of just ensuring that there is more representation. You can have policies, but it also has to be practiced. So changing in behaviors that I think each one of us can do. There's been a lot of improvement 
uh, as I said, in Delhi is a the improvement in DC. I think there are also institutions or groupings. For example, we have a lot of initiatives in the US like on women in na national security uh, and also doing things like creating databases of um, saying not just for government to go when they're looking for experts, but for media, for instance, having a database out there. And I know uh, a couple of young uh, Indian scholars, Rohan Mukherjee and uh, Kushi, uh, have uh, uh, have actually uh, Kushi Ra Singh Rathore have put out kind of a, a database on this of women who work on policy. I think there needs to or foreign policy. There need to be more initiatives like that that can facilitate uh, women's voices being uh, being heard and represented. Yeah, and like uh, you also like being from India and going to do your PhD in the US. I wanted to actually know about this, like how. Did you take this plunge of like working in the US and how was it initially like when you started out? Was it like a bit difficult or you like did not encounter any challenge as such? I mean, it's not fair to say so, but still like how did this plunge go about and how did you like sort of make your way through in, in like coming from a place in Delhi and then going and settling in the US? So, you know, some of this is choice, some of it is chance, um, and some of it is taking those chances when they come. Um, I uh, did my uh, undergraduate, my BA in history at LSR. And so, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a Lady Sriram College, for those who don't know, uh, which is known for having, to encouraging women to be much more vocal, take on leadership roles. Um, I was always interested in international relations, as I'd mentioned, uh, but I actually wanted my first kind of job was not I tried a few different things after uh, my BA. I didn't go want to do what everybody most people did at that time, which is go straight to do a master's degree. I knew I kind of wanted to be in international relations, but I wanted to work. And so I actually didn't go straight into doing a PhD or even a master's for that matter. I worked and my first job uh, was uh, in uh, technology, in the technology industry, which was burgeoning at the time. I was a, I used to, when you still had to code websites, I used to kind of do that. I learned a little bit of graphic design. So I worked in Bangalore and then in Delhi. But in the course of that, I had applied for my master's in international relations. Now, I'd actually got into a, a university in the UK, but because I decided to work another year, I said, you know, why not apply to the U US, which, um, you know, because that prospect came up. And so I ended up applying to the US, uh, got in uh, uh, to Yale University, decided to go there. Part of the change for me at that point, it was a master's in international relations program. Um, I'll tell you, you know, the studying part of it or the courses were actually easy for me because the Ratta system and the kind of way you're pushed in India sometimes, uh, you it actually makes the US system in some ways, especially when you're doing your masters, easy because people are constantly telling you uh, how good a job you're doing versus telling you everything you're doing wrong. And so that's something I learned also about what motivates people. Um, and for me, the exposure that I got, uh, uh, especially doing my master's, uh, a few different things that were challenging, but nonetheless that I learned. One was to be much more interdisciplinary. Now, I'd already come in having, you know, done kind of history, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, having worked in tech, this idea, grown up in a household with a mother as a doctor, but a father who worked in the private sector, you come in with very uh, different... You, or you come in with an understanding that different viewpoints, different disciplines matter. Um, but I, I will say both my master's as well as then my PhD, this idea that, you know, political science has something to offer, economics has something to offer, business schools. In fact, I did even courses in the business school, uh, these things. So you challenge yourself partly. Uh, when I decided to do my PhD, um, uh, the challenge there was, like all PhDs, whether you're a woman or you're a man, uh, is what do you do it on and how do you bound it? Um, and for me, it was one obvious that I wanted to do a PhD at some point. And I don't think this is an obvious choice for everybody. I do think uh, here, I do think uh, being a woman did play somewhat of a role in my choice. 
I'd always known that I wanted to, after my MA, I worked for three years at Brookings as a RA. I kind of knew that if I wanted to stay in this field, uh, that I would either have to go, you know, get a policy job in government, et cetera. It wasn't a choice for me in Washington at the time. Um, but also that if that was not a choice, then I had to get a PhD if I wanted to stay in this field. And I particularly had to get a PhD because women in particular, sometimes the credentials help in terms of you getting taken seriously. Uh, having said that, I think that was a choice then. Today, I think uh, you can still, I think the situation has changed. As long as you're doing in-depth research and analysis that is quality work, you don't necessarily need to do a PhD. But I still think, you know, um, if, for example, you want to stay in this field, uh, it is important. It's a, it, it is the one time in your life somebody, uh, and I don't think you should do a PhD if you're not, somebody's not paying you to do it in terms of stipends and, and tuition covered. But this is the one time in your life that you will get an ability to do that one big project that you care about the most and have the most time to spend on it. For me, the big challenge then was I knew I wanted to do a kind of a dissertation on U.S.-India relations. Uh, I had questions about it. I didn't think, and I was doing this in kind of the mid to late 2000s, I didn't think we had all the answers we needed about U.S.-India relations. The um, So one of the things, it's a very big issue. How do you, how do you bound it? And so for me, it was, I was at the LBJ school, the Lyndon B. Johnson School at the University of Texas at Austin. I had the advantage that I had a big presidential library, which meant a lot of archives. And I sat and I was going through files. And I didn't know that I wanted to look at the China factor in U.S.-India relations. I thought, like everybody at the time, that it would be things like personalities or Pakistan or process that had shaped the relationship. And then I found uh, kind of I let the, the the actual documents speak to me and what kept coming up, which was all these people in the Johnson administration in the 1960s, not hyphenating India and Pakistan as much as they did India and China. And so I said, huh, this is interesting. I wonder if China had shaped uh, this relationship more than we knew. And so I started off from there. But again, the big challenge was how do you bound something uh, like this, because it could be very vast. I started out saying, I'm going to do a 60 year, look at 60 years of this US India China triangle. I ended up cutting down, cutting that down by half. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, ended up uh, sticking to it because I thought this was something new and unique or a unique angle to take at that time. Yeah. And uh, presently, you are settled in US right now, but you come from India. And while being there also, you saw India away from India. So have you seen like the perception of India change over the years? Like what in your experience has that change been? Is it being for the good? Like how does the West see India right now? Um, so, you know, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, as much as I uh, have problems with the term global South, I have problems with the term West. I think it depends on who you ask, for instance. Uh, I do think the perception has changed. And I think that's because India's capabilities have changed. I think you saw see more continuity in India's approach to the world in some ways, uh, though you do see some changes uh, with the present government, for example, in the kind of, uh, you could say, uh, uh, much more forward leaning in some areas, including in the partnership with the US. But I think the broad contours of Indian fo India's foreign policy approach in the world, you've actually seen more uh, quite a bit of consistency. I think where you've seen uh, kind of change in terms of the how the world has seen India is, I think, a lot thanks to capabilities. And yes, leadership matters. So, you know, the, the kind of narrative, etc., uh, that leaders take, the role that they decide to play in the world matters. But at the end of the day, the thing that has struck me most from seeing India essentially not being on, in terms of in the early 2000s, not really being on people's radar other than the fact that it had, you know, uh, tested nuclear, had had the nuclear tests. And so that had brought it upon the world. But what I really saw, I mean, even in the US, but even from when, you know, as I said, I, at, at the beginning, I remember in India that went through a global, I mean, through its own financial crisis, could barely pay its own bills, right? And so that was the early 1990s. Um, but even by kind of the 2000s, you saw that as India's economy grew, uh, as it became more military and therefore had the ability to become more military, militarily capable um, and was kind of saying to the world, look, I am not 
going to be think of myself as isolated, as self-sufficient, as taking a 1970s, 80s approach to the world and actually thinking, not fearing uh, as much what will the world do to me, but thinking what will the, what can the world do for me? I think those changes, the capabilities and that different perception of not fearing the world, but seeing or thinking about the vulnerabilities that global exposure offered, the but the opportunities it did, those are the changes I think led to a change in global perceptions of India. But I would, you know, I see a lot of focus on narrative that if you say loud enough that India has arrived, people will believe it. I think it's not so much that narrative, it's the substance. And so to me, one thing I've seen in this, you know, there's a lot of international relations theory on this, but I've seen it myself, which is the view of India change as India's capabilities have grown. And there is no, there is no substitute uh, for that. And so partnerships can actually help build those capabilities, but those capabilities, in fact, will, will lead to more choices for India, even in terms of uh, those those partnerships. So I think you've seen it change. And to me, kind of, you've seen it change over time. So it hasn't been that, you know, suddenly uh, uh, India's, you know, the view of India changed this year, or the previous year. I've seen a gradual shift, uh, particularly from the early 1990s, but even in the 2000s. And I'll just give you one example of also not just how much attention uh, but how it's become a more greater priority, including the U.S. At the State Department, when I was first in D.C., there were maybe two or three people on the India desk. Uh, there are now over a dozen. Um, so, you know, that priority changes process. It changes. Uh, uh, so perceptions change priorities. Priorities change process. Uh, and it also, you know, personalities play a, a role in this. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to people's perceptions of what is India able to do? not just what India is willing to do. Yeah, and talking of that change, I would also like take this, like take this note to change the tone of our conversation a bit and segue more into a lighter note where I would want to know like, outside your professional life, uh, what activities do bring you joy? Are there any particular books, movies, cultural experience, cultural influences that have shaped like your global perspective or help you sort of like maybe Tone down your day. Um, so I would say it's family, friends, food, fiction, and travel. Uh, and in kind of sometimes all together, uh, but um, all these things bring me bring me joy. I really enjoy people. I think if you're in this business, uh, it's it's books, yes, but it's also people, and you really kind of, you know, that engagement, uh, uh, not just on professional level, on a personal uh, uh, level, uh, brings me a lot of joy, but also seeing for me travel, um, you know, sometimes when you travel a lot for work, you eventually get tired and exhausted, but I still love seeing different parts of the world, particularly those that I haven't explored. Uh, I keep trying to ensure that I see more of India as well. Um, that is my other kind of objective over the next few years. Uh, and so that that brings me joy because it's new experiences. It's uh, it's uh, you know we can it's it's getting out. So as much as I love books, it's getting out of the books and actually uh, seeing things myself uh, in person. And coming to our last question, uh, what are your personal goals and aspirations for the future? Like both in terms of your professional and personal life, do you plan to come on come out with another book, or there is something else in the pipeline which our audience would like to know? So the good thing about working at a place like Brookings is you're always working on your next book because uh, that is something that is encouraged or at least in-depth research. So yes, I am working on another book uh, and it's looking at how India's balanced its relationships with China and the U.S. from 1980 to the present uh, day. You know, we talked about change when I first started working on the India-China-U.S. triangle in the mid-2000s. People told me it was irrelevant uh, why are you working on that? You should be working on India-Pakistan or India's nuclear program. But turns out people these days are interested a little bit in India-China-US relations. Uh, but it's also uh, something that interests me deeply. So I am working on another book. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I've got a, a podcast, Global India. So we're planning a little bit for season two. So if your listeners have uh, either preferences or ideas for what we should do on season two, season one was in India-China relations. 
Uh, we're thinking about that right now. Um, and, um, you know, I, as I said, I, I want to spend uh, more in terms of personal goals, spend more time with the, the people I care about, and I want to travel more and see more uh, new places. So a mix of kind of professional and personal goals there for you. That's that's like a lot on the bucket for the audience and also me to like hold on to. And given like how your podcast has been and the viewership that it has, it's like purely insightful. And at least for me also like that way when I started off this, uh, my master's career in international relations, that your book itself was the first to go to. So yeah, I think that and, way. And the... Let me just say, Ayush, you saying that uh, means a lot. Uh, and it means a lot. I, I, I would especially say, you know, people often cite when uh, policymakers read their books to me why I write books is for students and it's for young people. It's because, um, you know, I, I remember how much of an influence they had in my life. And to me, uh, I have great deep admirations for those who teach uh, because they have that impact on younger people. And so to me, it's the ultimate compliment that you said you read the book when you were a student, because that's exactly who I write for. Thank you so much, Tanvi. And with this, we come to an end. We again thank Tanvi for taking the time to have this conversation today. And to our audience, we hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we did. Thanks so much, Ayush. It was great to be with you on the show. Thank you. Do visit Carnegie India's YouTube channel to access all the episodes of Anaita Speaker Series and other contents. Thank you and see you next month.